We are delighted to have Dr. Devin Bradley with us tonight, who's going to take us along on her trip through Canada and Alaska to the Arctic Circle as she explored and documented migratory and resident birds of the boreal forests in the Arctic tundra. Dr. Bradley earned her doctorate in ecology and evolutionary biology at Brown University, and she now teaches and has taught for the last, I believe it's 12 years, at the Irvine Valley College in Orange County. Please welcome Devin Bradley. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, and thank you so much for inviting me uh, to be here tonight. I see a lot of new faces, um, but also some friends and students who have logged in. So I'm grateful uh, for all of you that are here tonight. And I'm very excited to have the opportunity to share with you uh, some of the adventures from a birding and road trip that I embarked on in the summer of 2022. Uh, that took me to Tuktoyaktuk -tuk -tuk and all the way to the Arctic Ocean. Um, I thought I'd start by with just a brief introduction. Um, you heard a little bit about my background, so I don't think I need to add a whole lot more. Um, I often refer to this as a solo trip, uh, which in some ways it was, but I wasn't exactly solo because I was joined uh, by my dog, Pippet, uh, who is a rescue dog from Tijuana. He'll make a few appearances throughout the talk. He was very good on this trip, uh, even being willing to take some long naps in the car to help optimize my, my birding uh, experiences. Um, this is the setup that we took to on the road. Um, I have a Toyota Tacoma that's fitted with a um, camper that's made by a company called Four Wheel Campers. It's a, it's a lightweight camper. Um, but it really has all of the amenities you might need for such a long trip as this one, um, including that it, it pops up. Uh, so when I'm set up for camp and it's popped up, there's over six feet of clearance. There's a bed, a sink. Um, it's hooked up for solar. So it, it really had a lot of the creature comforts of home. Um, this setup is, is Charlie, uh, actually named after uh, John Steinbeck's Travels with Charlie, which is a must read for anyone who's itching to hit the road. Um, it was written about a cross country trip that he did with his dog, Charlie. So I'll take a moment um, just to kind of go over what I'm, I'm hoping to share with you tonight, um, beginning with this, this phrase, bird tripping. Um, so I was inspired by an article that was published, um, now it's probably been a couple of years, uh, that was written by Brian, Bryony Angel, and she wrote, she used this phrase bird tripping to write about the combination of birding and, and road tripping. And she emphasized how birders can benefit from, you know, getting out and exploring, and also how travelers, road trippers, van lifers could enhance their experiences by being introduced to birds. And so this phrase really resonated with me because what I'm sharing with you tonight is ultimately, you know, a big kind of epic road trip. Uh, but from its inception, it was very much planned around birds, uh, planned to, you know, maximize birding opportunities to target particular species of birds um, and to see birds and their behaviors in the types of habitats we, we don't have in, in Southern California, certainly. And of course, by you know, following the birds, they, they took me to just some incredibly beautiful places. I'll take a moment to give you an overview of the route that I, I took uh, for this two and a half month trip. But again, I'm just gonna focus on a particular portion of that. I also wanna take a moment up front to talk about uh, what is significant um, about these migratory journeys that Judy mentioned a moment, a moment ago and sort of what is um, beneficial to birds about migrating to these northern habitats. Uh, and as I mentioned, the, the bulk of the talk is going to focus on this particular portion along what's called the Dempster Highway in northwest Canada. Uh, this is area that's pretty remote, um, not very well traveled but I think will be of particular interest to birders. Um, I'll be focusing on, on bird sightings along the way, um, but also highlighting some of the really impressive migratory uh, journeys that birds are embarking on. 
So we'll grab our binoculars, uh, put on some muck boots and uh, make sure you've got a whole bunch of bug spray and kind of follow along with me as we head to the Great White Nork. Uh, this is an overview of my route, uh, including kind of pinned stops along the way. Um, I am lucky to have a teacher schedule. So I did this during my summer. I left at the end of May and it ended up being a, about a two and a half month trip in total. Um, I, I, I made my way through California and Oregon and Washington pretty quickly and efficiently because I was anxious to get uh, north of the border to kind of overlap with breeding season as best as I could. Um, so in my eyes, the trip really began once I crossed into Canada. I made my way north through British Columbia on this incredible highway called the Cassiar Highway. It was one of the most scenic portions of the trip, um, hooked up with the, the famous Alaska Highway, and then continued my journey uh, northward. So again, this might seem like a somewhat obvious question, but I, I think it's worth uh, taking a moment to kind of reflect on, on why, why birds head north and also why I wanted to head north. Um, there's quite a few reasons or factors that kind of motivate these really impressive journeys with you know, birds launching themselves into these like seemingly desolate landscapes, you know, often coming from the Southern hemisphere or the tropics, which you know seem like pretty good places to hang around and, and breed. Um, but there are a variety of, of important factors uh, that they benefit from in these northern habitats. Uh, the first is food. So there's an explosion of insect life every summer. I can attest to that. <laughs> um, but from the bird's perspective, this represents a lot of you know, high protein food to feed growing chicks, as you can see. Uh, both this song sparrow and white crown sparrow here are doing. There's no, oops, uh, there's no shortage of uh, open space. Um, so again, from the perspective of a bird, this means there's less competition for nesting um, territory. There's less competition for kind of foraging um, habitat, and also just like fewer pesky humans, right, to encroach on their um, you know, nesting habitats or, or kind of bother them during this, this critical time of their, their life cycle. Uh, long days over the summer. So depending on the latitude kind of throughout this trip, uh, we're talking about, you know, 18 to, to 22 hours a day of sunlight, which leaves a lot of time to, to get things uh, done. Time for courtship, you know, nest building, finding food, all those good things. Um, compared to tropical locations, birds that breed at higher latitudes generally have um, fewer pet predators, fewer parasites, and, and fewer diseases. So, you know, taken together, you could see that these are worthwhile <laughs> journeys that birds are embarking on. And, you know, looking at the list, it also kind of summarizes part of my motivation. Uh, not so much the food, that wasn't really a highlight of the trip, and the insects were something to contend with. Um, but I wanted to follow birds along their, their migratory routes. I very much felt kind of the pull of open space, you know, the opportunity to experiencing, excuse me, experience these vast tracts of wilderness that are you know, like mostly devoid of kind of heavy handed uh, human impacts. The long days helped. As I mentioned, I was kind of trying to maximize my, my teacher schedule and these long days uh, gave me more opportunities to, to travel and get things done. Um, I was successful in evading both predators and diseases. Uh, Pippet did pick up a few parasites along the way, but he was fine in the end. All right, so we're going to jump right into this um, area uh, called the Dempster Highway. I arrived um, at the intersection of the Klondike Highway and the Dempster Highway about a month into my trip, so toward uh, toward the end of, of June. Uh, this is a uh, very special and very unique road, as you can see from the map, sort of, <laughs> without a reference, but uh, the, the start of the Dempster Highway is about 25, 30 miles east of Dawson City um, in Yukon, and not too far from the uh, from the Alaska border. And um, 
I'm going to highlight a few of the reasons why it's so special, but uh, this image is showing one of the main ones, which is that it, it uh, is a road to the Arctic Ocean. It's Canada's northernmost road and the only road in Canada that crosses into the Arctic Circle. Um, the road winds through just incredible wilderness, like breathtaking wilderness. We sometimes think of tundra and kind of, um, you know, subarctic landscapes as being like maybe featureless or, or kind of more desolate, um, but that's certainly not the case here. Uh, the road weaves through taiga, boreal forest, um, several different mountain ranges that I'll show you, you know, it crosses valley floors, creeks and rivers. It's just, you know, spectacular as, as far as the eye can see for the, the full duration of the trip. Um, I'll mention briefly, the road was constructed, I think construction began in like the late 1950s and took 20 years to build. So the road is built over permafrost, which is no easy task. Uh, this portion I'll get back to later in the talk. Um, the portion between Anuvik and Tukchayuktuk was actually just completed in 2017. So the ability to access the um, Arctic Ocean during the summer is, is a new feature of this road. Okay, so incredible views. Um, just, yeah, again, uh, mountainous landscapes um, and a whole lot of water, um, a whole lot of fresh water specifically. One of the main effects of permafrost is to prevent meltwater from, from draining away. So you'll see as we go along that the landscape is scattered with, with many of these melt ponds. Um, and we'll be making our way ultimately to the Mackenzie River uh, Delta. Um, one other thing I wanna just highlight in terms of the uniqueness of this location and this road. Um, some of the Dempster Highway passes through um, an area uh, that escaped glaciation during the last Ice Age. So this is a region known as Beringia, right? So the land and kind of maritime area between the Lena River in Russia and the Mackenzie River um, in Canada. Um, this is land that, you know, until 190 million years ago was, you know, the coastline of ancestral North America and served as this really important refuge, um, again, escaping glaciation and this um, you know, like transfusion of life from between the two continents and, and from Asia to North America. So, you know, herbivores, predators, plants um, inevitably or inadvertently, you know, made their way over this, this land bridge. And of course, people came too. Um, so kind of taken all together, we have this, um, you know, road <laughs> that's traveling through a region with fascinating land history incredible geological history, which I just don't have time to talk about tonight, um, you know, a relative lack of disturbance to the wilderness, and, and that makes for just incredible scenery, but also incredible habitats for flana, flora and fauna, um, including, of course, our, our feathered friends. All right, so I'm going to take you down the road with me for the remainder of uh, this talk, and we're going to be referencing sort of a different map um, as I do that. Um, so the map here is showing essentially a trail of eBird checklists. So every pinpoint on this map is an area where, you know, I birded and submitted a checklist to, uh, to eBird. Um, as you can probably guess from its remoteness, it's, it's not a particularly well birded area. So the idea of contributing to some documentation, uh, was a motivation for me. I also want to mention that you know, it's not typical that we talk or reference a road <laughs> um, so much when we're talking about birding locales. But something to keep in mind is that um, in this region, you know, the wilderness is literally beginning right at the edge of the road. So aside from, you know, traditional First Nations usage of this land, um, you know, there's very few human disturbances there aren't side roads, uh, there are very few trails. So you're really just getting out and, and wandering around, um, which on the tundra actually can be quite difficult um, to navigate. Okay, so we're gonna start, uh, start on our road. 
Uh, this is the southern port part of the Dempster Highway, and we're basically making our way here through Boreal Forest. And you can see the southern Ogilvy Mountains are starting to pop into view. Uh, so this forest is pretty typical of what I had been experiencing in Canada up to this point. It's a mix of, of black and white um, spruce, some you know cottonwoods, aspens, and in, in more of the riparian zones. And you know the forest this time of year, you're hearing the sounds of yellow rumped warblers, Wilson's warblers, ruby crowned kinglets. There are quite a few um, Canada jays in these forests as well. Uh, a little bit further down the road, um, I stopped at the one kind of like official visitor center uh, along the Dempster Highway, and that is at Tombstone Territorial Park. Um, named for the Tombstone Mountains, which you can see here, um, the traditional name of these mountains translates to among ragged peaked mountains. Um, unlike the Beringia region I mentioned, these are glacially carved um, mountains, as you can see here with these, you know, triangular peaks and steep kind of walled ridges. Um, so it's a really beautiful park. Um, they have, this is the one area that does have some trails, including some, you know, accessible uh, boardwalk trails around, uh, around the campground. Um, so I did camp here just for one night on my uh, northbound journey, took a nice hike along the Klondike River Trail, which you can see here. Uh, the park is known for its bird diversity. Uh, there's, I think, 150 species or so documented in the park, which, including this American robin, um, which might not seem like a lot to us spoiled uh, California birders, but remember that um, uh, diversity is generally decreasing with latitude. So a lot of the birding um, in this area is more of a kind of like quality over variety type of experience. So for this region, that's that's a pretty uh, significant number um, of birds. Um, and so the first night at the campground, again, was a lot of familiar birds, American robins, white crowned sparrows, orange crowned warblers, lots of dark eyed juncos. Um, and you may be familiar with these birds from the time that they spend with us in California, many of them uh, for the winter. And something I'll continue to mention uh, through this talk is that, you know, even for our, our familiar birds, right, this was an opportunity to experience, experience them in very different ways. They're like looking very sharp in their breeding plumage, you know, they're singing, they're courting, they're sitting on nests or they're feeding young. And for many of these species, those are things we don't get to experience um, here. Um, one of the birds that was contributing to the kind of sonic background uh, in this area uh, is the great cheeked thrush. This is a very shy and elusive bird, even more so than uh, Hermit and Swainson's thrush, who you might be familiar with. Um, in fact, this is the quote uh, that's at the top of their Birds of the World account. Um, and I'll just briefly read it, but it's, it's shyness and seclusiveness, it's habit of breeding in only the most inaccessible places, and it's almost unbroken silence during most of the year have kept the taxonomic, distributional, and life history facts concerning it uh, in mystery for so long that the gray-cheeked thrush has been correctly regarded as one of the least known American passerine birds. And this is going to be kind of another theme with the birds that I highlight tonight. These are birds that we, most of what we know about their biology comes from observations on their wintering grounds. And we know far less about their, their breeding biology. So this gray cheeked thrush um, breeds in, in taiga and low Arctic shrubs. There's no shortage of that in this region. I'll be showing a few of these distribution maps from the um, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and, and you can see their migratory um, range in yellow, and we'll be focusing on um, the kind of pink-orange color here, which indicates their, their breeding range. Um, so these birds typically arrive to the region uh, in the latter part of, of May after migrating through central and, and kind of eastern U.S., the kind of central and Atlantic flyways, um, which I've always thought of these, kind of a North American bias, but I've always thought of these birds as like an Eastern species, right? 
they're using these eastern flyways. Um, it's amazing though, when you look at these maps and see these birds where they are, how far west they're actually spreading out um, as they head north for their, their breeding grounds. Um, this is a species that has experienced some really alarming uh, precipitous declines in recent years. So once again, um, you know, a greater understanding of their activities on their breeding grounds and, and along their migratory routes is, is really critical to informing uh, conservation efforts. Um, if you're familiar with hermit thrush or Swainson's thrush, you might be looking at this bird and asking, what's the difference? <laughs> and there are some key, um, key field marks that are different, but one of the best ways to tell them apart is by their song. And I'm gonna play you just a short clip of this. Okay, so really, a really beautiful thrush song, um, <clears throat> but definitely a different kind of tone than Hermit and Swainson's thrush. Uh, it's a bit more uh, wheezy, a little kind of a little bit more higher pitched. Um, but again, definitely just a beautiful sound to be hearing uh, hearing in the background. I could have stayed and watched this bird all day, but we're we're looking to make some uh, northward progress. Um, so that's what we're gonna do. And within a few miles of, of leaving the Tombstone Park and heading north, uh, we quickly climbed to the highest point on the Dempster Highway, which is at about 4,500, 4,600 feet. I think the tallest mountain peaks are around 7,000 uh, feet approximately. So we're in the tundra. Uh, that's the most significant change here. Um, so we've left trees behind. We're passing melt ponds. And the vegetation is primarily a, a cover of, of, you know, sedges and um, cotton grasses. And you'll see some, some shrubs mixed in um, as well in, in sort of patchy locations. Um, it was here that I first encountered um, my first lifer of the trip, which is the American tree sparrow. I have a particular love of sparrows. So this was one of my more uh, anticipated bird. I was quite excited to find one. Um, ironically, hanging out in the land of, of no trees, uh, this bird compared to the thrush has a more wide ranging uh, distribution. Um, again, it's more well known on its wintering grounds, which typically does not include California. And the entire population is migratory. So the entire population is, again, pushing north and then spreading out um, east and west. So another species that we, we don't know a lot about in these northern um, habitats. Um, on the dumpster is actually one of the most common birds uh, in this uh, region, um, but not in the boreal forest. So we are going to cross back into boreal forest and, and leave these behind um, for a little bit. Uh, while we're on the topic of sparrows, I couldn't help but just share a couple more images of sparrows that I, I shared the Dempster Highway with. Um, lots of savanna sparrows. Uh, they're pretty common in the more like shrubby, tussock, tundra uh, parts of this region. And they go up pretty high in elevation, up to, I think, about uh, 5,000 feet. Um, so really streaky sparrows, uh, these beautiful like lemon yellow supercilia. Um, and just, you know, hearing their songs uh, sort of all around. Uh, also lots of white crowned sparrows, another bird that I got a kick out of following north, right? Um, they departed from California a little bit earlier than I did. So I had to kind of catch up with them, but you know, a bird that we have singing for us throughout the, the winter. So this wistful, uh, beautiful song that was contributing to the sonic backdrop was one that I was, of course, familiar with uh, from down here. Um, there were Lincoln sparrows. These became less common um, the farther north we made it along the Dempster Highway. Um, fox sparrows as well. This is a red fox sparrow, so it may look a little different to you than ones you may have encountered here. Um, this is a group of fox sparrows that breeds, or I'm sorry, that winters in central Texas and then eastward. 
Um, so not typically found in California. Wherever there were sparrows, there seemed to be common red poles um, nearby or flying over. These small finches seem to materialize out of, out of thin air often um, in small flocks. I'd be somewhere really quiet. And then all of a sudden I'd hear this like approaching rapid, like trilly, twittery kind of rattling flight calls. It, it sometimes felt like these were the birds that were the most offended by my presence. <laughs> they seemed to kind of be chasing me out from wherever, wherever I was. Um, these are one of the resident birds of this area, which is amazing to think of uh, when you think about the length and sort of extreme temperatures of their winter. So both hoary and common red poles um, stick around for the winter. And they spend a lot of time on the wing. It's not super well known, you know, how they are surviving um, these harsh, harsh winters. Uh, this is a beautiful female. Uh, the males in breeding season have a much more extensive kind of pinkish red breast, um, but I didn't really get good photos of, of the males. All right, so we've made our way um, into an area that's known as the Blackstone Uplands. And uh, this is considered one of the kind of richest areas for bird life along the Dempster. Pretty similar topography from what we've been seeing kind of open relief, mountains in the background, um, you know, lots of uh, melt ponds along the way. Uh, this is the Blackstone River. And so even this late in June, you still have these, you know, significant um, ice sheets floating along the river. One of my first official stops in this region was at an area called Two Moose Lake, um, which only partially lived up to its name. Uh, there was one moose <laughs> in the lake. Um, these mammals were so fun to encounter from a safe distance um, on, on this trip. Of course, these are massive herbivores. They're consuming like, you know, 85 to 90 pounds of vegetation a day, um, but they have a strong preference for sodium rich plants. So um, aquatic plants like uh, pondweed and, and milfoil, um, so because of that preference, they, they spend a lot of time feeding in ponds like this. Um, they have some really neat like snoot nose adaptations that allow them to submerge their head for impressive amounts of time to, to feed on these salty plants. Um, I had a closer encounter just a, a little ways down the road. Uh, this is a, a female moose. And um, it's worth mentioning that I'm actually Photographing this from my car, um, Pippet is napping in the back seat, like unaware of this massive animal just outside, uh, just outside the door. Um, and which is good because this was actually one of my biggest concerns uh, traveling with a dog in these regions. Um, moose do not like dogs. Um, the potential for an encounter with a moose is much, much higher than with a black bear or grizzly bear. And those encounters can be quite serious. Um, so I appreciated the opportunity to watch this, you know, from, uh, from the safety of the car. Uh, she was doing quite a bit of feeding and actually her calf um, was standing by. This was just a puddle, <laughs> obviously a good size one, but this was just right off uh, right off the side of the road. Um, I also had the pleasure of watching this pair um, do a river crossing. So you can see here the mom is, you know, of course, confidently going in and the calf is, is trailing behind. Um, it actually kind of paced back and forth on the, the shore for quite some time. You know, moose are you know, five to seven feet at the shoulder. So of course the mom was able to, to get across this uh, with much more ease than, than the calf. Um, but he eventually worked up the gumption at, to make the crossing and, and mama was uh, patiently waiting on the other side where they were reunited. So as fun as this is to see, of course, it's not just moose uh, who are in these lakes. This is great habitat for waterfowl and for shorebirds like these red-necked uh, phalaropes, um, who I did observe in lakes and ponds. This is actually another just roadside puddle uh, in the rain. 
Uh, these are quite dainty birds. Um, they spend up to nine months of the year at sea, mainly in the southern hemisphere where they feed primarily on like small crustaceans and often in association with whales. So they are shorebirds, but kind of functionally, they are almost like the world's smallest uh, seabirds. Um, so they migrate to the tundra and subarctic tundra to breed. And uh, they do so just in, in patches of sedges on the ground, close to lakes and ponds. They're such fun birds to observe, and, and some of you maybe have done so. Um, you know, they ride like high on the water, almost looking like tiny gulls, and they're rapidly spinning and, and doing this very frantic style of feeding, kind of paddling their legs and going through these motions to bring food up to the, the surface. Um, and you know, watching them do this in a roadside puddle off the Dempster Highway, it's it's hard to picture them adventuring on the high seas, you know, during during the rest of the year. Uh, these are all females. So interestingly, uh, phalaropes are a great example of an exception to the general pattern of of sexual dimorphism in birds. So in this species, it's the females who are larger more brightly patterned and more brightly colored during the breeding season. And as follows, it's the females who initiate courtship um, and may in fact mate with several different males, while the male hangs back to, to brood and rear, uh, rear the young. Okay, so another shorebird I had hoped to find is the surf bird. Uh, who, this is one of the few locales in Canada where surfers breed. And um, I went to its namesake mountain <laughs> in hopes of finding some. Uh, so these are birds that do not associate, you know, near to the road. And so we kind of hiked up along this ridge that's coming into view um, in, in this video. Um, we did not have any luck finding these surf birds. They leave, you know, we're getting close to July now. So they leave pretty early in July. They depart their breeding grounds early. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, it was kind of a hard time to, to look for them. Um, but I did get to enjoy these uh, beautiful views, um, tons of amazing uh, wildflowers along the way, including these um, uh, large swaths of cotton grass that just make for a, a really magical experience. This is actually also one of the few kind of clear blue sky days uh, while I was there. So uh, all the more reason to appreciate it. Um, on the way down, I had an encounter with a female willow ptarmigan um, and her chicks. So she's kind of standing her ground here, telling us to skedaddle, which we, which we promptly did. Um, willow ptarmigan are very common northern grouses. They're the largest species of, of ptarmigan. And they associate with these um, like dwarf willows in, uh, in the tundra year round, another year round bird. In winter, they are almost all white except for a few black uh, tail feathers. But in breeding, they kind of molt into this more mottled plumage, which is pretty well camouflaged in this type of vegetation. Um, the male who we encountered uh, later is also modeled, um, but has like much richer kind of chestnut in the neck and head and a kind of much thicker uh, orange eyebrow uh, that you can see here. Okay, so we need to get back on the road. Um, you can see why I make uh, such slow progress, <laughs> um, but we are determined to get to the Arctic Circle. And to do that, we have to gain some elevation and go over uh, this region that's referred to as the Windy Pass Summit. And that's what we're looking out on here. This is that part of Eastern Beringia that I uh, referenced earlier. Um, so this is the area that escaped glaciation and so is home to some really interesting um, uh, flora and uh, fauna. Um, it's also pretty incredible to think and, and kind of look out on this just as a region that's remained unchanged for so long, but also consider, you know, the people that would have migrated eastward across the, the Bering, um, across this land bridge. And, you know, this landscape is very similar to what, what they would have been uh, looking out upon, which is just a really cool uh, thing to consider 
This is another location that lived up to its name. The Windy Summit was in fact quite windy and quite stormy, but we took some time to kind of explore out in this valley here. Things get a little quiet between here and our first major pit, spot, uh, pit stop, which I'll get to in just a moment. But we did have a nice surprise on our way, uh, an encounter with this uh, bohemian waxwing. So bohemian waxwings occur um, pretty sparsely in kind of boreal forest in spruce woods. Um, and this one actually caught my eye from the car while I was driving because it was talking for insects in a manner that's very similar to what um, like swallows would do, um, but far less graceful <laughs> and far less adept. Um, these are quite similar to cedar waxwings, which you again may be familiar with from the time they spend here in California. Uh, they're a bit bigger, uh, they're a bit more kind of gray where uh, cedar waxwings are brown. The most notable difference are these like prominent white and yellow spots along the wing. And also these undertail coverts um, on the bohemian waxwing are a kind of rufous cinnamon color. Uh, that area is white on um, cedar waxwings. Um, both these species have the kind of wax-like red nubs on the um, secondary feathers here. And both those and the yellow um, on the tail here increase in prominence with age. So this is lacking in juvenile birds. And those pigments, the, the carotenoids, um, come from their from dietary sources. And so the, the kind of resulting ornamentation is linked to their feeding habits. So this seems to be a beautiful, uh, well-fed bird. Um, the bohemian part of their name is in reference to their nomadic lifestyles that they lead during the winter months, um, where they'll roam really widely, seeking fruits, um, and, and sometimes somewhat irregularly, you know, ranging far south into the lower 48. Okay, um, we're getting close to the Arctic Circle, I promise, um, but we made one stop along the way to camp um, along Engineer Creek. Uh, this is an area that you can tell from the color is very highly mineralized, right? So the water here is percolating through um, you know, sulfur bearing um, sediments. One thing I want to kind of quickly uh, draw your attention to is, is these trees in the background. Um, so this is a very typical um, type of boreal forest that's referred to as a drunken forest. Um, you see a lot of these trees kind of like tilted or falling down. These trees are perched on, you know, a shifting active layer of per permafrost. So as the ground you know, freezes and thaws, it's very unstable and it's essentially throwing these trees around. So it gives a very unique kind of look um, to these forests. And I wanna say one more thing about, about black spruce and you have to forgive the terrible photo, but it helps me make a point. One of the ways you can tell apart black and white spruce is that black spruce have these almost club-like kind of clumps at the top of, uh, at the top of their trees. Um, hopefully at least one of you is looking at these clumps and thinking maybe one of them could be an owl um, because I did that many, many, many times in hopes of finding a Northern Hawk owl along this road. I pulled over for what just ended up being clumps of needles at the top of a black spruce tree. Um, and I didn't ever find my northern hawk owl, so that's just a good reason uh, to go back. Okay, so we're gonna make some northward prog progress here, and we are making our way to the Eagle Plains um, Plateau, which will be about 230 miles where, from where we started and actually the first stop for gas. Um, so the first kind of pit stop along the way. One of the reasons I wanted to show uh, this recording in particular is you can see it's starting to get quite smoky. So boreal forests are a fire adapted ecosystem and fire creates you know, a mosaic of, of young and old trees in the landscape. And all through Northern Canada, right? You're seeing evidence of how fire has shaped the landscape. Unfortunately, the frequency and intensity of these fires has increased in recent years, a phenomenon we're certainly familiar with in California. And so this is a satellite image from that summer. 
So in the summer of 2022, Alaska had their biggest fire season since 1950. By the end of the summer, over 3 million acres had burned, including tundra burns. So the smoke that I'm starting to experience was reportedly making it making um, its way over from Alaska, but it's hard to tell because there were some significant fires burning all through um, Yukon as well. Uh, you know, these are ecosystems that are very slow to recover from impacts, especially a tundra burn. So given how critical these habitats are to wildlife, you know, to breeding birds, uh, this is a, a very alarming uh, consequence of, of climate change. Okay, but we'll continue north about 25 miles past Eagle Plains. We finally arrive at the Arctic Circle. Uh, this is my first time in the Arctic Circle, certainly Pippets having made it up here from Tijuana. So we're in the land of the midnight sun. Uh, just a few days prior on June 22nd, the, the sun never fell below the horizon. I'm here on June 27th, so, you know, still in for some really long days, which was just a very cool experience. Um, another 25 miles or 30 miles beyond that, we cross the border from Yukon to the Northwest uh, Territories. Um, and actually, I haven't mentioned it yet, but this is now the third time we're crossing the continental divide between the drainages to the Pacific and the Arctic um, Ocean. Um, I used this rest stop as an opportunity to, to wander out amongst the tundra once again and um, uh, shortly or uh, quickly upon doing so started to hear these calls, these very musical calls of the uh, Lapland longspur. Really beautiful bird to see in its breeding plumage. Um, even upon hearing it, they're pretty hard to find. They'll, they'll jump up on the top of these tussocks and then quickly kind of hunker down in between um, these clusters of sedges. And when they're when they're hunkered down, they they disappear quite impressively. Another example of a bird that we know about from its wintering grounds and know very little about uh, from its uh, breeding habitats. It's very much a truly Arctic songbird, and most of their breeding ter territory is inaccessible by road. Uh, Smith's long spur breed here as well, but I did not encounter any of those. Um, so it's after crossing into the border of the Northwest Territories that um, the landscape starts to change again. This feels like kind of the most Arctic in, in character. Um, this is that unglaciated landscape. So these are mountains that have been weathered by, you know, wind and erosion and instead of glaciers. Um, and once we make our way through the Richardson Mountains, we are now just on a downward descent to the Arctic Ocean. So we've been kind of gaining and losing elevation through these mountains all along. And now we're just uh, getting close to sea level and, and following it till we get to the Arctic Ocean. But we've got a couple rivers to cross uh, before we get there. So we're making our way through the Mackenzie River Delta. Um, this is Canada's biggest river, second only to you know, the Mississippi River in North America, uh, named for a fur trader from Montreal, Alexander Mackenzie um, in the late 1700s. Um, but prehistoric people were following routes, uh, the route of the Mackenzie River Valley for you know 10,000 years um, or more. Uh, specifically, we need to first cross the Peel River. Um, and to do so, we have to get on a ferry. So there is a cable ferry crossing that moves back and forth across the Peel River um, all day. This year in 2022, the river levels, they experienced a lot of flooding. The river levels were unusually high. This ramp I'm about to get off on, they had to you know, build up uh, to be able to, to disembark off the ferry. So it had been closed up until about two weeks prior to this. So had I arrived much earlier, this would have been the, the end of the road I would have had to, to turn around. We're passing through Gwich'in land for most of the way we've been traveling so far, but this area in particular um, is home to the First Nations people, Gwich'in, and there's camps and cabins set up all along the Peel River. Uh, fishing is a very important activity here. Um, and just when you think we're like in the tundra, 
we're we're back in the boreal forest again. Um, so Pivot's looking out on the northern extent of the boreal forest in Canada. This is at like 69 degrees north latitude. And the only reason trees can go this far north in this area is because of the influence of the Mackenzie River. Um, so we spent a night here back in the boreal forest, you know, surrounded by our familiar boreal forest birds, including this um, yellow bellied flycatcher that was calling pretty incessantly in, in the background. Um, the next morning, we continued our journey north. I picked up my lifer uh, rusty blackbird, which is another, again, eastern bird that spreads quite far west as part of its migration. Um, no other North American blackbird breeds uh, this far north, so that was fun to see. And we've got one more river to cross. Um, so we passed through Fort McPherson. And actually what you're seeing the approach here is the confluence of the Arctic River, Arctic Red River and the Mackenzie River. Um, as I pull up here and I'm waiting for the ferry uh, to come and get me, I'm watching these cliff swallows um, gathering mud along the, the river shore. And uh, I couldn't tell really where they were taking the mud. I was trying to kind of follow them and, and losing them to see where they're nesting. Um, it wasn't until I got on the ferry that I figured out what was going on. So what looks like insects kind of darting across the screen here are cliff swallows. And as it turned out, they were nesting on the, the ferry itself. Um, so great strategy for having, you know, good access to mud for nests and a, a fresh supply of insects, you know, back and forth. Uh, across the river. Okay, so we are getting to um, Anuvik, and this is an important uh, region, or I should say an important town, the only town in this region. It's home to about 3,000 people, and it's located, once again, right at the northern edge of the boreal forest, but also the northern edge of the Gwich'in territory, and then also the uh, homeland of the Inuits. Um, prior to its construction, Anuvik and Tuktoyaktuk were only um, connected during the winter months um, by an ice road. And so this all weather road that was completed in 2017 now connects Anuvik to Tuktoyaktuk year round. As you can imagine, it was no small feat constructing a road in, in this type of landscape. Um, so the ice road prior to this would form um, from the you know, frozen Mackenzie River Delta and, and the Arctic Ocean. And again, would connect these two towns during the winter, but would be cut off during uh, the summer. I've never watched ice road truckers, but I've been told that season two <laughs> focuses on this road, if anyone's interested. Um, as you can imagine, locals in Tuktoyaktuk were quite split on this um, decision of building a road here. Uh, many people favored the benefits that potential economic benefits that greater access to tourism could bring, while others kind of fear for the impact to their local culture, their local way of life, and also some inevitable environmental impacts. So um, this road makes mining, gas, and oil extraction in this region, you know, much easier. Okay, so onwards to uh, onwards to Tuktoyaktuk, and this really is um, kind of my favorite my favorite part of um, of the trip. Uh, so just incredible scenery, mind blowing scenery, and um, what you start to see pop up in in the background here are these really cool special hills called pingos. Um, pingos are a feature of a permafrost landscape, but they're ba basically these like ice cored hills that only form in these kinds of regions. There's a limited number of them in the world and the highest concentration um, is, is in the Tuktoyaktuk region. And it's here that I had some of my favorite encounters with uh, birds and their migratory stories. Um, this is a whimbrel uh, who many of you will recognize as another common wintering bird in, in California. Uh, but here on their breeding grounds, they behave entirely differently. 
Uh, first of all, they're not on a shore. This is, you know, open tundra habitat at the end of, of tree line. And they're quite territorial. So this posture that you're seeing uh, was something they did over and over again, where they're kind of extending their, their wings upward um, toward an intruding bird or potential predator. And as they do that, they're nonstop calling. Um, until whatever's bothering them leaves, which in my case, I was sure to do promptly. Um, but they're doing this from whatever the highest point is in the landscape, which again is just something we don't typically see <laughs> with our, our shorebirds. Um, and this was not something unique to, to just Wimbrel. Um, lesser yellow legs in their breeding plumage were doing this. Um, solitary sandpipers as well. So it was a behavior I saw over and over again. Um, but I want to take a moment, I'll be, I'll be wrapping up um, soon here, but I want to take a moment um, to say a little bit more about, about Wimbrel and their migration. So um, most of what we know about Wimbrel on their breeding gap grounds comes from these two populations in, in North America, um, this Western Alaska population and this um, Northern Manitoba population. But these two populations have very uh, distinct and different uh, migratory routes. Um, so let's look at the Mackenzie River population. So this star is pretty close to exactly where we are right now. And this wonderful map is from Scott Widensall's uh, A World on the Wing. And he describes how in 2008, um, some ornithologists, some researchers managed to get um, satellite transmitters on a number of birds that had stopped down in Virginia. It was assumed that these Virginia birds would head north to Hudson Bay. Seems pretty logical, not that far of a trip. So you can imagine their excitement when instead of doing that, they hooked a left and made their way up to the Mackenzie River region, a good, you know, three, 4,000 miles from Virginia. The next fall, uh, these researchers watched in astonishment again as these tagged wimbrels left their staging grounds in the Canadian Arctic, flew over the Canadian Maritimes and navigated directly into tropical storms and hurricanes out on the Atlantic. Not by accident, repeatedly and seemingly deliberately using the slingshot tailwinds of these storms to propel them south um, to Southern South America, most notably uh, Brazil. Um, and the Hudson Bay population is doing something totally different. They're taking about a month uh, to take an inshore route and head down to Venezuela and, and some northern parts of, of South America. Just incredibly amazing and um, yeah, just a mind-blowing thing to consider as I'm you know, standing up here watching, watching these birds. Uh, speaking of incredible migrations, the champion traveler is the Arctic tern. Uh, these you know, pale grayish seabirds breed in the highest latitudes of the Northern Hemisphere and winter in some of the um, most southerly latitudes of the Southern Hemisphere. And so if you draw a line between these waypoints, um, they're migrating some you know, 22 to 25,000 miles a year. Um, they're such graceful, beautiful birds to watch. Um, you know, they plunge dive and, and surface dip for a wide variety of you know, crustaceans, small fish. Um, and there were large flocks over these milk ponds all, all along the road. So I spent a lot of time watching uh, these birds and then was stopped in my tracks as I approached a large pond where in addition to a flock of, of Arctic terns feeding, there were about 15 long-tailed Jaegers making these like long swoops over the water and in some mo moments dive bombing uh, the terns and stirring up a lot of activity. Long-tailed Jaegers are predatory seabirds. Um, they spend over three quarters of their life on the open ocean, and they're known to be piratical um, on the open ocean. So they pursue gulls and terns to steal their food. Supposedly, they don't do that on the Arctic tundra. Um, their diet during the breeding season is primarily lemmings and voles. 
Um, but apparently old habits die hard because they were absolutely uh, harassing uh, these, these Arctic terns. Um, I've seen these birds on pelagic trips out of uh, Orange County, out of uh, Southern California. And, um, you know, again, seeing them nest like this or behave like this in the tundra was just, just a mind blowing experience. Uh, they held me up for a little while. There was a pair that just did not want to get off the road, which was no problem, um, no problem to me. Um, so I got to watch them for quite some time. They eventually just kind of flew a short distance off, off the road. I'm sure there was a nest nearby. They just lay their eggs between these clumps of vegetation. They don't use nesting material or, or anything like that. Okay, so we're so close um, to the end. After this just incredible drive, we made our way into Tuktoyaktuk. This is an Inuit hamlet. Uh, there's about 900 people that live here year round. Um, and of course, I did what any birder would do when they first arrive at a new place. I went straight to the town dump uh, to look for goals. Uh, and I found some. Uh, these glaucous goals are large, pale goals with a circumpolar uh, Arctic distribution. Uh, their wintering um, range extends pretty far south. So many of you have likely uh, seen these in California. I, I just hadn't gotten around to it. So this was a, a life bird from, from, from me. And from here, it was just a, a short ramble through town to get to the shores of the Arctic Ocean. Um, the Inuits in this area allow you to camp um, right along the shores here. Uh, it, was, it was quite an overcast and stormy day uh, when we arrived. We felt appropriate um, to the location. Uh, this, of course, is you know the ocean that surrounds the North Pole, lies within the Arctic Circle, and, and has you know perennial ice. This portion of it off the coast of Tuck is referred to as the Beaufort Sea. Uh, we spent a few days birding here. It was incredible. Huge flocks of greater white-fronted geese, tundra swans, sandhill cranes, lots of ducks, including things like white-winged scoters, uh, long-tailed ducks, a ton of shorebirds as well. So we're at the end of the road. Um, of course, I've still got a lot of miles to cover, but I won't, I won't take you with me for that. Uh, for those of you that are interested in kind of the, the bird part of this, I saw 73 species um, along the Dempster. Seven of those were, were lifers for me. And of course, there were just a whole lot of other birds I didn't have the time to talk about, like Pharaoh's golden eye. Uh, shorebirds like Wilson snipe, um, raptors like bald eagles, golden eagles, northern harriers, and a whole, whole slew of other birds that uh, I just didn't get good photos of, so they didn't really make it in, including loons in their breeding plumage, which was another uh, incredible thing to, to experience. Finally, um, before I call it quits, um, I hope that what some of you might take away from this is you know, some inspiration to embark on a similar type of journey and maybe even consider adding this to your bucket list. And if you have that thought, I would absolutely encourage you to do it. It was an incredible experience. I would have liked to have arrived a little bit earlier to have been at a little bit more of the prime of, of the birding uh, breeding season. It is a remote region um, and, you know, it requires some preparation and some common sense. There's limited opportunities for gas, so starting with a full gas tank, carrying extra uh, fuel. The road is notorious for flat tires. There's really sharp pieces of shale on the road. Fortunately, I didn't get a flat tire. I did get a broken windshield. Having a windshield kit would have come in handy. Um, there's better service than you would think along the road, but there are long stretches with no service. So having some kind of emergency communication device and then bug spray, protective clothing, more bug spray, and then even more bug spray. Um, again, I focus tonight on, on just this uh, particular portion of the trip. My trip continued westward from here. I crossed over into Alaska at Poker Creek, which is the northernmost uh, land border crossing in the US, so that was pretty neat. I spent some time in Fairbanks and at Denali National Park, which was incredible, uh, and some time um, in Anchorage in the Kenai Peninsula, 
Um, uh, and I was joined by uh, some friends for this portion. So it was nice to have some company. And then we came back down through the Alaska Highway and took the Okanagan Highway through um, British Columbia. So a different, different route on the way back uh, with lots of, lots of bear encounters um, along the way. Okay, so I'm gonna end there. I'm happy to entertain any questions that you might have with the time we have left. Um, I share photos of this trip and other things on Instagram and on Flickr. Um, I have a blog where I kind of I kept a travel log during this whole trip. So I posted portions of that um, on the blog. And even though it's been a while, <laughs> I'm still determined to post the rest of it. So for those of you that are interested in, in more, um, that's where you can find it. Okay, so I will stop sharing my screen. And again, happy to answer uh, any questions. Devin, thank you so much. Um, you. If you have questions, please type them into the chat and I'll read them off to Devin. I should have said that at the beginning of the program. I'm so sorry. So start typing away, everyone. <laughs> Devin, that, your encounter with the moose and the moose calf was pretty incredible. That was... <laughs> it really was. It was, it, it was an incredible... You know, I have to say, like, all of my mammal encounters, like happened in a very comfortable circumstances, which worked out well. I didn't have any like worrisome encounters. So yeah, that was that was a great up close experience to have. Oh, that's great. I uh, grew up on a book called Grass Beyond the Mountains, and he talks about um, being treed by a cow moose in June for three days, unable to get out of the tree. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, your your talk about the, the moose are more dangerous than the bears is. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, it's true. Everybody, a lot of people ask about bears. I'm like, I was, yeah, much more worried. Every bear we saw was either from a distance or was running, you know, running away from us. That was we had no close encounters with bears, but um, but yeah. Well, seeing seeing wimbles at the tops of trees must have been quite the experience. It really was <laughs> that behavior. The first time I saw it actually was with the lesser yellow legs and I was driving and their calls are so loud, especially, you know, from that vantage point. Um, and just, yeah, it was mind blowing. I see a couple of questions. Um, Mike is asking, oh, about traveling in the fall. Yeah, I really skipped over that. Um, I've seen um, some just beautiful photos of the fall foliage at that time. It seems just incredibly scenic. Um, of course, the the bird experience would be would be different at that point, right? You've got um, a lot of species that are migrating south and and leaving. Um, they do have a, a there is a group that does a small bird festival up there that I think is you know their fall, which is kind of like late <laughs> late summer. Um, but, uh, I think they're, I forget what the group is called, but yeah, just, I was mostly inspired to say that because of images I've seen of the scenery and travelers I encountered along the way who, who recommended coming back at that time of year. Yeah. Someone had a question about whether or not you swim in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, I didn't swim. <laughs> I did wade. <laughs> Both Pippin and I waded in the ocean. Um, yeah. Okay, so Dawson City is a quick, uh, quick drive. Um, Dawson City is about 30, 30 miles from the start of um, the Dempster Highway. The highway is about, like when you put it into Google Maps, the map I had earlier, it says 12 and a half hours. I don't think that's realistic, but um, I think it's about like 590 miles. So I ended up taking, I think like 10 days or eight, nine days. But, you know, as you could tell, I was going really slowly and camping and just enjoying it along the way. Um, I think people that drive it, like just for the experience of driving it, you know, do it in, in a couple of days. And there were, you know, I emphasize the remoteness, but there are, there are a lot of travelers on the road. 2022 was the first year that the borders were open after COVID. Um, so it was the first time, you know, kind of summer tourists were, were coming back. Um, it's a popular road to bike. Um, there were a lot of like motorcycle travelers on there. Um, so yeah, other people kind of doing similar things. I met two birders along the road, which was really cool. Um, but yeah. 
Okay, yeah, challenges of internet connectivity. Um, so most of, yeah, I had a trouble submitting eBird. <laughs> um, most of my most of my eBird checklists, you know, I was doing the offline version of it and then uploading them once I got into service. Eagle Plains, which was the first gas stop, has a little like motel um, that has Wi-Fi. So I was able to get reception there. And then Anuvik also has good reception and Wi-Fi. So those were my two, um, uh, those were my two kind of stopping points. Um, yeah, motorcycles and cars. So I wouldn't call it traffic. <laughs> um, those were obviously time lapse videos, but you wouldn't go more than like three or four hours without passing someone else on the road. So, you know, again, for like safety concerns or flat tires or things like that, um, you know, someone would come by. And I found traveling through Canada, and I feel like the more remote we got, the more communal kind of people were, right? Like everyone, well, especially with birding, cause I'm pulling over a lot and everyone would stop, you know, to, to, to see if I was okay. Um, so I think there's a little bit of like, just like a camaraderie among the travelers there. So yeah, enough that um, I felt safe, but not so much that I was bothered by people. Yeah. Okay. So traveling as a single woman in remote areas. Um, and my camera was stolen at, at one point. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I can't tell who's leaving that comment, but, um, you know, I, I could say a lot about this. I'll, I'll try to be brief, but I, you know, gosh, I think it's smart to be cautious and aware of, of some of the challenges that come uh, with traveling as a single woman. I definitely like, there were parts of this trip where, I felt um, anxious and nervous and kind of had that like, why are you out here by yourself kind of feeling, but it was never because of something that happened, right? It was only because of my own sort of like fears of that. And so it was something I just chose to be smart about, have common sense about, but not allow limiting my experiences. Um, my precautions, so one thing with that Garmin in reach is I had an arrangement with my mom that I would send, cause that's a satellite communicator. So I would always let someone know like where I was going to be the next night or where if I was gonna be, if I wasn't gonna communicate for a day. So someone always knew like where I was supposed to be. So if I went out of communication, um, you know, that would have been a, a red flag. Yeah, my camera got stolen in Anchorage. So um, the, which is again, ironic because a lot of questions come up about safety in these remote regions, but I had no issues at all. Um, and then, you know, I spent a night in the city and my camera got stolen. So I was not able to take any pictures the whole way home, which was very, very hard for me. Um, but yeah, I can't see who's leaving that comment, but if you if you want to chat about it more, I'm, I'm happy to do so. But um, it was a very comfortable experience. Canadians are really nice. I think that's part of it. <laughs> but people kind of look out for you. You know, everyone checks in at campgrounds. People were giving me tips about, you know, which routes to take, which routes to avoid. Um, so fortunately, you know, I, I really didn't experience any actual, you know, encounters that were concerning to me. How did I find Pippin? <laughs> um, so Pippin, there's a rescue group down here that like coordinates with a, a woman in Tijuana um, who brings up uh, sort of litters of street dogs. Uh, so I found him through a friend. And actually, since you ask, we did, we bumped into a couple um, who had the same like camper setup that I do. So they, they came over to talk and they ended up from, being from Tijuana and um, knew the woman <laughs> who organizes the street dogs. So they had a nice conversation with Pippet in Spanish and they were all very excited about it. So yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, Amanda. Yeah, Amanda, I'll, I'll be happy to talk to you more, more about that question for sure. All right, it looks like that's probably the end of the questions for the group. Devin, thank you so much. What a great talk. I really, oh, thank really enjoyed you. it. Thank you so much for having me. I really, uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Well, it was a great talk. We appreciate it.